I have your attention now. Good afternoon. Excellent, thank you. Welcome to um, this afternoon session. We're gonna go ahead and get started uh, just a few minutes late. I apologize for the delay. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here today to talk about arts education policy in the session titled Mapping the Federal State Local Policy Pipeline, an example of STEAM. Um, my name is Jeff Poulin, and I'm the Arts Education Program Manager here at Americans for the Arts. Um, you all are quite familiar with Americans for the Arts at this point, but if you're not familiar with the Arts Education Program, our charge um, is to unify a diverse set of stakeholders to advance arts education policy at the federal, state, and local level, um, including a number of different topics, one of which is STEAM. So I'm very excited to focus on that here today. Um, a couple of housekeeping items as we get started. Um, I just wanted to review the three learning objectives that we've set, that we hope to garner a theoretical understanding of the federal, state, local policy pipeline related to education policy in America. We want to illuminate the practical application through the example of STEAM education policy in the state of Georgia. And we'd like to interrogate this framework through the lens of attendees' individual local context through discussion fueled by the example um, at the High Museum in Atlanta. Um, as a reminder, Americans for the Arts has a few policies related to accessibility, which is part of our ongoing work related uh, in the pursuit of cultural equity. First, we believe that amplification benefits everybody. So um, in the course of this section, uh, this session, we ask that you please use a microphone if you say something that is intended to be heard by everybody. No one should need to request that someone use a microphone so that they can hear or understand. In that same vein, I do ask that side conversations um, be kept uh, to a minimum as they are disruptive to fellow attendees and can keep others from fully hearing the session. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I will be your first presenter um, and will also be your moderator over the course of the next bit of time. We've divided the session into four sections. We're gonna start with me with a couple of um, questions just to get us oriented, um, review some federal policy, look at the impact on states and look at local implementation before engaging in some Q&A with all of you at the end. Um, so who are we? Um, our, uh, the presenters of this session. I already introduced myself. My name is Jeff Poulin, and I'm joined um, by Kate McLeod, um, who is also um, a member of the Arts Education Advisory Council at Americans for the Arts, and um, Megan McLaren from the Georgia State Department of Education. Um, who are all of you? I would like to just ask a few questions, and if you could just raise your hands. Um, how many folks in this room um, would say that they are primarily an educator? Great. How many people would say that they're primarily an uh, administrator? Wonderful. How many people would identify as an artist? Great. How many folks um, work in the realm of policy? Awesome. Okay, cool. How many folks work um, at the local level? What about the state level? And any federal people here? Okay, that's me. I'll be a federal person. Great. Um, okay, that helps paint a picture. Um, so I do hope that you can tap into those different areas of expertise um, as we do discuss this, because we're talking about um, a number of different items that will transcend those different um, spectrums that I just laid out. So what is STEAM education, um, first and foremost? I'm very curious to hear from the audience um, if anyone could give us a definition to just be a jumping off point. Is anyone feeling generous? That would be ideal if you would, wouldn't mind coming up to this microphone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Welcome to Denver. Um, I've worked with teachers for 22 years in putting arts education from cultural organizations directly into schools. Lately, it's felt like that STEAM is thrusting arts forcefully into the midst of science, technology, engineering, and math. Thanks. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Does someone want to add to that? Sure. Okay, lunch. Yeah, get those steps in, that's yeah, great. Yeah, get those steps in. Um, so I work at an arts integration um, public elementary school and integrating the arts into the STEM theory um, really speaks to people's recognition that creativity, um, artistic expression, artistic thinking is necessary as we move forward in 21st century skills and thinking. Um, yeah, 
So it's like a yeah. Great. Your voice just got much louder. Absolutely, thank you. No, and um, and that's both of those definitions are really um, fantastic. And from my perspective, and of course, there is no. I think there probably is a formal definition of steam. We do not promote one um, because it is different in in any individual context. But I would say, um, particularly through the work of Americans for the Arts with the Innovation Collaborative, which is a national um, uh, collaborative effort of about sixty um, nonprofit arts, cultural, um, STEM, STEM, and uh, otherwise education organizations. Um, and we say that um, STEAM is the intentional integration of the arts on equal footing with the STEM subjects to create um, and bring about innovative and creative thinking. Um, so it really is that compilation of the arts with the four STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, but that does place the arts on equal footing, not in service to um, the other subjects, and really the intention is to bring about those um, habits of mind that we so desperately need in uh, the workforce of tomorrow. So why do we need STEAM policy? This is the big question um, that we're grappling with today. Would anyone like to rationalize that? And we're in the afternoon slump, that's fine. So I'll give you my answer. Why do we need STEAM policy? It's very simple. We have federal education policies in the United States um, that ultimately um, articulate the way that we craft our curriculum, assessment, and otherwise um, educational provisions from the state down to the local level. However, if we talk about STEAM as a pedagogy at the local level, we must reflect that in the policies that are supportive so that we can use the dollars or that we can spend the time and professional development in these different areas. Um, without the policy, we will not see equity and access to this type of learning um, from state to state or from community to community, um, and ultimately we won't see the larger gains um, that we hope uh, to implement through this intentional pedagogical structure. So um, that is the, the very simple answer. But I hope to talk to you a little bit about federal policy and on the theoretical level, the federal state policy pipeline for education that we um, are so fond of here at Americans for the Arts. On your table, I did prov provide for you um, a copy of a brochure of the Arts Education Field Guide, which is a key publication of the Arts Education Program here at Americans for the Arts. It was published in 2012. Um, a full disclaimer, it's being revised right now. You might see the words, no child left behind in there. Those will be struck. Um, and a couple other edits being made. But this um, tool does allow us to look at the arts education ecosystem in such a way to better understand the formation um, and implementation of education policy as it relates to the arts, including STEAM. Um, and one side of this brochure, you'll see the ecosystem as we see it um, with the students at the center, which is what we really believe. Um, and these spheres of influence relate to the advocacy strategies that are used um, from arts education supporters around the nation. Um, we know that this is an incredibly effective way to um, not only implement but affect um, the development of arts education policy at the local level, the, the state level, and the federal level. Levels. Um, however, the other graphic that I would bring your attention to is on the left-hand side, which are the tiers of influence. And this is our way of describing the federal to state to local policy pipeline in relation to arts education um, and the numerous stakeholders who participate in the creation and implementation of policy in that area. In the top uh, tier, you see at the federal level a number of key players, such as the White House, Congress, U.S. Department of Education, um, ed arts education associations, um, other education associations like the PTA, um, and uh, otherwise uh, groups that may impact arts education, like the National Endowments for the Arts or Americans for the Arts. These folks contribute um, in tandem to figure out the best ways to craft federal education policy. Most recently in 2015, we saw the development of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which was a prime example of all of these folks getting together to pursue the arts-friendly policies within that act. However, federal policy, as we all know, is not um, the official uh, right of the U.S. government in implementing education. It is a guiding post um, usually used with incentivization to compel state, levels, uh, state level education agencies to craft their new education policies. We saw this happen through 2016 and 2017 within ESSA. At the state level, you have a similar structure of folks that contribute to the development and implementation of state policy, um, and this uh, 
in, engages the state legislatures, the State Department of Education, the State Board of Education, superintendent, um, and advocacy um, and associations, uh, advocacy groups and associations across the board. And those folks get together and craft these state plans and guidance and funding infrastructure that work to compel local arts education implementation to occur, which in involves everyone from the school board to businesses, principals, teaching artists, cultural organizations, and um, community partners. We also know that those are the folks who work most directly with young people um, and students in classrooms and ultimately deliver the arts education experience that we want. Now, there, is other, there are also arrows in this that work on their way up, and we hope that that is a way for us to understand that the local does influence the state and the state does influence the federal. There's another way to envision this at Americans for the Arts that we use in terms of these three cogs, that we have thinkers and best practice, or um, those that are working in the field to determine the new pedagogical, evaluative, or otherwise structures that we use in arts education. In STEAM, this really happened in the 1980s um, in the Northeast Tech Corridor, the Florida Space Coast, um, Silicon Valley, and so forth, where the STEM movement was moving pretty quickly. Um, and if you read up some of the history of the STEM movement, it's quite interesting to see who was behind it and their potential intentions of just selling more computers to schools. But ultimately, it did revolutionize um, the way that we fund um, some subjects in schools and the integration of science, technology, engineering, and math to be one. Um, with the STEAM movement, those same folks that were pushing STEM talked about creativity and innovation all the time. So for STEAM, it was the arts community that said, actually, what you're talking about is design thinking, what you're talking about is creativity, what you're talking about um, is the integration of the arts and design into these STEM subjects. And so it was those thinkers that started talking to the policymakers, which really brought to fruition the 2013 creation of the Congressional STEAM Caucus, which currently sits at about 72 members. It is bipartisan in nature and led by um, Representative Suzanne Bonamici of Oregon, um, and at the time, Representative Aaron Schock, uh, who then resigned, and now uh, Representative Elise Stefanik of New York uh, for the Republicans. And so we have a bipartisan caucus that passes policy. And these folks uh, did so in 2013, 2014, and ultimately passed some policy that did have some teeth in it as part of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which does impact the implementers or all of you that are working at the local level, um, which ultimately deliver arts education through the STEAM lens. However, we argue at Americans for the Arts that there's a piece missing in this graphic, and it is this feedback loop. These, this is our advocacy strategy, and this is why we come together at conferences like this and work with our peers across the spectrum to influence those thinkers and best practice and those policymakers to improve the funding infrastructure, the guidance, and otherwise that will implement or that will impact the implementation of the STEAM education in classrooms and community centers across the nation. So with that, I want to return to this model because this is the model that we will be thinking of um, when discussing STEAM education policy here during this session. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the actual policies um, that have been um, signed into law at the federal level, and then I'll be joined by my colleagues um, in Georgia to talk about how that has transformed the Georgia Department of Education and um, the work at the High Museum in Atlanta. So let's go back to 2015. It was December the 10th, 2015, um, a Christmas miracle as termed by President Obama at the time to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, formerly known as No Child Left Behind, today known as the Every Student Succeeds Act. You see standing behind him, Representative Bonamici, a STEAM champion, um, as well as a number of other educational influencers within Congress and the administration. The Every Student Succeeds Act has a number of arts-friendly policies um, that you're welcome to read on our website. There's a number of resources there, but one of them is the inclusion of STEAM. This was a Hail Mary amendment, if you will, that was passed at the very last second um, after both the House and Senate had approved the bill um, and was offered by Representative Bonamici. The bill, uh, or the amendment, excuse me, goes on to say that the integration, the integration of other academic subjects, including the arts, into STEM programs to increase participation in STEM, improve attainment in STEM-related subjects or skills, and promote well-rounded education. This is uh, not the best language that we would particularly want to see, but let's face it, no one really reads the amendments. But what this does is it kicks open the door to allow for every time that the bill says STEM, 112 times, it could mean arts-integrated STEM learning. So the uh, several billion dollars that are tied to STEM programs, all of the provisions for professional development, and the implications for local school districts as they pursue um, their needs assessment of well-rounded education, STEAM must be considered. In the well-rounded subjects, uh, 
it's really important for us to understand too that the um, money that has been set aside for well-rounded subjects is the first fe new federal money for education, um, for this type of education in about uh, two decades. Um, and here, it's no matter, you see the number of arts-friendly provisions, but we also see that right in a row um, are listed science, technology, engineering, and math between writing and the arts. So we know that all of these subjects must be considered. And these, the consideration of these subjects is tied to new federal block grants that go to states and are distributed um, through their uh, own state capacity to local school districts, but that do fuel a decision-making process through local education agencies to ensure that districts are looking at a well-rounded education that includes both STEM and the arts. Shortly after, the STEM to STEAM Act was introduced in Congress, which goes on to direct money from the National Science Foundation to explore the impact of STEAM learning. Um, this is a provision that um, we don't see uh, being a huge issue for um, a number of colleagues in the House or the Senate, and we expect that it will continue to move forward um, in due time. However, it is um, a, sort of problematic for those in the science field because they do feel that some of their money is being taken away from them. But why I highlight this is that we have the first federal STEAM provision in the Every Student Succeeds Act, but we also have this language of STEM to STEAM being embraced by members of Congress, being passed by committees and ultimately the House of Representatives, and being implemented in the non-arts field. So this is to say that it's not just us talking about this anymore. It's not just us fighting our way in the door, but it is the other STEM subjects actually embracing the arts to bring about creative and innovation thinking. So with that, I would like to turn it over to um, my colleagues from Georgia to kind of take it away and share a little bit um, about what's happening there to better paint the picture of what this all means from the federal level to the state and local. So I'll turn it over to Megan. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Megan McFerrin. I am the STEAM program specialist at the Georgia Department of Education. Um, it's really exciting. It's a new position and a new initiative in Georgia. This is the second year that it's been around. Prior to that, uh, three years ago, a fine arts specialist was hired at the Department of Education after a 23-year hiatus of the fine arts not being represented. Um, so we are really excited. We're at an exciting time where the arts are really being embraced in the state at the Department of Education. Um, I wanted to pull this from the DOE strategic plan. This falls under that well-rounded piece. And in one of the first lines, it says that we need a holistic approach to public education, one that provides fine arts opportunities. It's also in our strategic plan to increase the number of STEAM designated schools. Um, I report to two departments, lucky me. Um, I report to both the CTAE, which the A is agriculture in the state of Georgia, as well as curriculum and instruction. So this is really being embraced by the entire Department of Education and also collaborate with federal programs to figure out how schools can use Title IV funding to support STEAM initiatives, um, PBIS, and school nutrition. Currently, there are seven STEAM certified schools in the state of Georgia, four are elementary, two middle, and one high school. This really stemmed from a need from industry, business and industry. Um, the film industry is growing in the state of Georgia and most of the employees are coming from outside the state. Uh, in addition to that, in the first weeks of my job, I spoke to someone from the construction industry who said, you know, when kids are growing up, when they're little, they love to do things that are hands-on. They love to play and tinker and use Play-Doh, but somehow they're losing that through their education. We need to collaborate, we need the arts. Uh, so it's a push coming from multiple places saying, we need to get the arts back in schools, which is really exciting. So a loose definition of how we're defining it in the state of Georgia is that it's teaching and learning that emphasizes process over product and empathy through the use of design thinking, real world application, student collaboration, and interdisciplinary connections. However, it's not just about STEAM jobs, it's really focusing on the needs that all of the jobs in the future will have. All of our students are gonna to need to be creative, they're gonna to need to be innovative, they're gonna to need to be empathetic. We're not gonna exist in silos as communication increases and we're a more global economy. We need to be preparing students for jobs that don't exist and really the best way to do so is making sure the arts are in the schools. 
So for our STEAM schools, what it really looks like is um, it's driven by local initiatives. That's looking at what the local issues are to that school. Georgia is a very big state. Um, a school in Atlanta is going to look very different than a school in Savannah or a school in Moultrie, Georgia. Uh, we need to make sure that our schools are looking at their local economy and their local initiatives. There's daily interdisciplinary instruction that includes the arts. There's business and community partnerships, which I'll talk more about. Professional learning, and that includes making sure that all teachers in the school receive arts training. And the art educators really become leaders within the school. Uh, I consistently hear from arts educators, you know, I'm not so sure about STEAM, I'm not so sure about arts integration, what does this mean for my job? If everyone's doing art, am I still gonna have a job? Which is a valid concern, but what we found is that the art educators become essential. They drive the process, they drive the foundations that the students need to uh, really excel in a STEAM school. So this slide is to show an example of what STEAM might look like. I think often when we think of STEAM, we think of 3D printers and art robots and technology, but really it can look very different. Uh, the images you see here are from a school in Harris County, Georgia, which is a rural community, and their focus for their STEAM program is agriculture. So here you see a lesson where the students were using the engineering design process and design thinking to write lyrics about a chicken coop that's on their campus. The students have created a community garden where they've brought in local policymakers, local superintendents, uh, to come and be part of the school process. And what's happened as a result of this school becoming STEAM certified is the district has made a commitment to wanting to have every school become STEAM certified in the area and wanting to really push the arts into every school. It's really a ripple effect, these examples that happen and when these schools really adopt this pedagogy and adopt this culture that other schools come and see it and say, my students need this too. This is what I want my school to look like. So at the core, STEAM is really about empathy, equity, and engagement. This is a way for students to engage with content where they might not have had an entryway before the arts were there. We see consistently that our girls are more involved in STEAM programs and in STEAM schools than they would be in STEM. It gives them a way to engage. Uh, it's about seeing the world from someone else's perspective, a skill that's gonna be essential moving into the future workforce and students are more engaged. I love this picture that's all the way on the right where students were doing um, an erosion unit studying Andy Goldsworthy's art. And it says, Andy's art is in all caps, amazing. Um, and that I think just shows how you can bring that engagement and that excitement to topics that might seem more dull to students such as erosion. Um, we consistently hear from students or from our teachers that student behavior issues decrease Attendance goes up, probably related to the behavior issues going down, the teacher retention increases, and the test scores in science, math, and literacy go up with STEAM adoption. Um, we hear consistently from teachers that they feel like they're getting their profession back. They're getting that creativity back to be able to come up with units that are locally driven, that are exciting to them, um, and are innovative. School partnerships are an essential piece of the certification process and of what we look for in certification. So some examples that you see here, um, the school on the left is looking at the film industry in Georgia and partnering with the Georgia Film Academy. The top picture is actually at the High Museum of Art and you'll hear from them and they've provided professional learning for many schools who are working on STEAM certification. And the bottom is a sculpture that was created for a performing arts center in Columbus, Georgia as part of their STEAM initiatives. Um, the, the school and community partnerships can't be emphasized enough. This is really at the core of the STEM and STEAM certification process and saying that our growth of students can't just be um, by the teachers and it can't be just the administrators who are taking responsibility for it. All of the community needs to come in and be a part of it. Um, so we do ask our schools to look into their local community and identify where local artists are or arts organizations that can partner with them. Um, and to conclude, I just wanted to share a few lessons that I've learned in the past few months in this job. I've, I've only been in this role since October. It's been a lot of learning. Uh, the first is that something I hear a lot is that there are two Georgias, and many states that are large might have similar 
uh, experiences where people in our rural communities feel like they're very divided. There's Atlanta, Metro Atlanta, and then there's everywhere else. So trying to figure out how we can support the rural communities and pushing this out into South Georgia particularly. So I spent a lot of time on the road um, and definitely see the need for additional professional learning in the South Georgia area. Um, listening first, the arts can be really scary. I think it's easy coming from the positions and being people in the arts that, you know, why wouldn't you want this for your students? The arts are great. But the reality is that it can be really intimidating. Um, I've had teachers crying in front of me saying, you know, I have my students that are going home hungry and they're not eating when they get home and I'm dealing with the pressure of test scores and this is how I'm assessed, this is how my students are assessed, but you want me to change my whole curriculum, this is too much. Um, so coming at it of a place of how can we work with you, how can I support you and support this work, and also give you the confidence to know that you can do this and that um, this is something that is gonna be great for you and great for your students, and having that perspective and knowing it's gonna take time and take that training, um, that, that it's an intimidating process. Making it personal, I think a lot of times people are disconnected a little bit from the arts and don't realize how pervasive it is in their day-to-day -day lives. So I always start with teachers trying to figure out a time or an experience that they've had where they've connected with the arts or connected with some sort of design in their lives and just trying to find a personal connection so they can get to that why and move beyond some of the arts and crafts that we see in schools. Understanding that changing culture takes time. This is not a overnight process. We tell schools that it's gonna take a minimum of three years to really become a STEAM school, where that is your school culture and that's what your school has adopted. And absolutely leveraging partnerships. Um, at the state level, I could not do this work without the partnerships, such as with the High Museum and Georgia Council for the Arts have been essential in getting this work done. And then this quote I think sums it up. I know this is a lot for one slide, but just wanted to share from uh, the art teacher at our first STEAM certified school in the state of Georgia. She said, STEAM has transformed the way we plan, think, and do at our school. Planning is collaborative and creative. Teachers are working together to see how they, how student, to see how they can teach students in different ways. We are reaching out to experts in our community to make global and local connections. We find that students are thinking creatively in how they approach a problem or project. Our behavior has improved because students see the real world connections with our STEAM curriculum and lessons serve a purpose in their minds. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> My name is Kate, uh, Kate McLeod. I'm the head of school and teacher services at the High Museum of Art. And just give me a moment. We are in the largest room um, at the Hyatt Regency. I'm just kidding. But it's so big. This room is really, really large. Jeff, am I doing it? Help me. Someone. This room is so big. I was told we're live streaming right now. So, oh, okay. So I gotta get it right. Um, so hi, hi. Kate McLeod, High Museum of Art, Atlanta, Georgia. Has anyone ever been? Okay, a couple people. It's a great museum, mid-size. It has about 16,000 works of art in the collection. Um, if you saw Black Panther, anybody saw Black Panther? It was featured heavily in that movie. Lots of critical thinking that we can do about the museum scenes and Black Panther. Um, that's the high, so we, that's our claim to fame. Um, we have been working in the STEM, STEAM world for quite some time, since maybe 2008, nine, without realizing what we were doing. Um, before I kind of jump into that, who do we serve, what, 
what does this look like at the high. Um, we have about over 55,000 students who physically come to our museum through our doors, through our programming. Um, we do more students to us than outreach out to schools. That's kind of shifting, but we're trying um, more to get students in front of real works of art is, is sort of our um, philosophy. We serve over 5,000 educators through various professional learning programs. Uh, more than half of them come from Metro Atlanta, so that's really our audience based on our location. Um, we have various partnerships with different school districts that are uh, considered rural, um, but really our main focus is on Metro Atlanta, um, which has over five million people in it. I recently learned that about Metro Atlanta. Um, more than half of those students come through a program we call Art Access, which provides free tickets and bus transportation to students who go to schools that receive Title I funding. Um, so yeah, in around 2008, 2009, we kept hearing a need from um, our local state agencies that our students were not doing so well in math and science scores. We didn't have a math and science tour. We had just about everything else. Um, but when it came to students coming to the museum, we didn't really talk about math and science. So we reached out to Georgia Tech. Um, they are the experts in the field and they have a like an outreach arm within Georgia Tech called Seismic. And I had to put the logo on the slide because Seismic is just the longest. Okay, it's the Center for Education, Integrating Science, Mathematics, and Computing. Um, they have existed for about 30 years and their whole role is to help science and math teachers better teach math and science concepts. Um, they started going into the STEAM world with us um, around 08, 09, um, when we had an exhibition called First Emperor, China's Terracotta Army. So we had all of those soldiers that came to the high. It was really cool. Um, but really the high was faced with a community need. How do we meet this need of our students um, in terms of boosting math test scores? Can you do that at an art museum? A lot of people would argue you can't but there's some recent studies going on right now out of the University of Arkansas that's really showing that you can. Um, so we developed a lot of presentations, professional learning with Georgia Tech, and that we asked their students if they could come up with a math and science tour for us, you know, outsource, right? So let's get the Georgia Tech students to do it for us. Um, they came up with some really beautiful work. Um, just, just gorgeous, look at this. Okay, write an equation that represents Calder's jewelry. Who knew that Alexander Calder made jewelry, let alone that you could talk about conics and math concepts within it? I didn't know, I didn't know that. Um, they also produce things like this for us, beautiful. Don't understand any of it, um, but lots of charts and graphs. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. The issue is with this is that we're made up of art history um, professionals within the museum field. So we were receiving this data and information and our goal, my goal in particular, is to train 120 volunteer docents on then giving the tour to students. So this was great, but the implementation of it was just kind of lost on us. Um, we still love it and we still like to look at it, but we realize that an art museum, maybe we're not the best place to teach science and math concepts. Maybe we need to leave that to our math and science teachers. However, the thing that we can do is talk about creative problem solving, critical thinking, how is an artist similar to a mathematician? And that's the approach we ended up taking. So thank you, Georgia Tech, but we, we couldn't embrace it in the ways that they wanted. Um, so we have our own definition. Everybody has their own definition of STEAM. Jeff, pull us together. We need one definition. This is the one we use at the high, that it's an approach to teaching that makes natural connections across many content areas so students can better engage in all of those thinking and creative practices. Um, I always hear, you know, well, what about humanities? What about reading? And then everybody's like, let's add more accurate, like it's stream or it's 
whatever it is, and it's like, no, it's just school, right? Or it's just good teaching is what we're talking about. Um, we found this graph that's really lovely. It's from the University of North Carolina. Again, that idea of partnering with as many people as possible to do the work to meet the needs of the students is what we're all about. Um, so you are an engineer, and this is the engineering design process. You identify the pro like what, what's the problem? Very similar to the scientific method, right? Um, you explore, you design, you create, you try it again, you make it better, and failure is part of this. You're going to mess up. Uh, but it turns out that this is also the artistic process as well, right? It's how artists, and I saw so many artists raise their hands today. And we have writers and poets and, and musicians. This is it, right? I mean, this is how we all think. It's like you're going to try it out, you're going to mess up, and then you're going to try again. Um, so that's really the approach that we took at the museum, and it's worked out really well. Um, we look at works of art with our students and think about how could it have been created? Um, what did the artist use balance, symmetry? What, how, what was the process to get this made? Um, and what we have found this, when we started this program officially in 2013, 2012-13 is that we had around 2,000, 3,000 students doing the program and today we can't we can't meet the demand of the need. It's over I think like seven or eight thousand students come and do this program. Um, it's by far our most popular. We're always uh, doing professional development around this as well because there is an official STEAM process in the state of Georgia, which by the way, Megan is the only human in the United States to exist as a STEAM specialist. There's no other state that has a STEAM specialist, right? Am I right? Yeah, right? Okay, I'm like, I'm not making this up, am I? Yeah, she's the only one. So that's amazing. And, and the fact that Georgia has really embraced this in this way is really cool. Um, so we're really trying to work with them, the DOE at the state level, and then looking at Jeff and AFTA to make sure that we're on the right path um, to really meet the needs of students and what, what is relevant to their lives. Um, we take this so seriously we made a logo for it. I paused for effect and it wasn't as dramatic as it should be. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it from me. And I'm gonna pass this back over to Jeff. Do you want me to stay? Okay. Thanks guys. Well, thank you both so much for uh, your presentations and thank you all for uh, so actively listening and engaging with all of that. Um, I did, we have about 25-ish um, minutes left. Um, that I do want to engage in some really meaningful conversations, so I'll just ask that as you have um, any questions, uh, you can come up to the microphone and, and make those. Um, but since I do have the microphone privilege at the moment, I will just uh, start us off um, with one, and it really, um, kind of does go out to both of you um, because the number one thing that I hear as I travel the country and work with folks and talk about STEAM and do all of this stuff is that, you know, it's um, changing the minds of decision makers to get uh, this stuff done. And so I guess my question for both of you is how did you get to be able to do the work that you're doing? I mean, in 2012, 2013, a really early adopter of STEAM stuff. I'm at the High Museum. And then, of course, in your role as the first um, State Department of Education STEAM um, specialist. You know, what was that process like, and do you have tips for others who might want to uh, engage in that way? Sure. Hello. Hi. Um, I think the process was listening to the needs of, of the community. Um, it was almost as if it didn't come from us, um, it came from hearing that our test scores were low, and how can we meet the needs of the students, but then also um, how does it fit within the museum's own mission statement? Um, does it make sense? There's some things that don't make sense, um, but then some things that do. And then to be totally honest, when you work in nonprofit world and a grant funder is saying, we need something to do with STEAM education, you are more likely to produce programs that 
meet that. So that is what we're finding more and more too, is that um, decision makers, uh, grant funders, they want to see STEAM uh, funded at local arts institutions. So we're, we're kind of following the money a little bit too. That sounds a little harsher than I mean, but it's reality. No, I, absolutely, I mean, I would say, I think there was a study done about education funding and there's some like $80 billion available for STEAM, yeah. for STEM, excuse me, in the nation. And so as we start to transition from STEM to STEAM, that's a lot of money. Um, I came to this role actually having worked for Kate at the High Museum of Art. Um, so fun connection there. Um, but really, I think in terms of STEAM at the state of Georgia, it came from our current superintendent being an incredible advocate of the fine arts. Uh, he came into the role at the state and wanted to fill that gap that had been created and that there hadn't been much support for the arts in quite some time. So he had his first two projects that were to fill that role of not having a fine arts specialist at the Department of Education and then wanting to make sure that schools had the option of not just being STEM certified, but also being STEAM certified. Cool, can you actually talk a little bit about, you both mentioned the STEAM certification. I'm a little curious, can you unpack that for everybody, what that means and what that process would look like for a school? Absolutely, so the STEAM certification is a formal certification process that's offered through the Department of Education. Um, on our website, you can find our 10-page rubric that we use that is very comprehensive, but really what it's looking at is a school changing their entire, their entire culture. Um, and so for STEAM, it would really be centered around the arts, and we define the arts as uh, visual arts, dance, music, theater, and media arts in Georgia. So they can choose what that looks like or what would be the right fit for their students or for their community or for the partners that are in their community. But really, it's changing their day-to-day -day -day instruction to be more hands-on, to be interdisciplinary, so making still connections between science and math, but bringing the arts into the fold as well. Um, Kate mentioned earlier the humanities. It's, it's not leaving anyone behind. So we always say, you know, the E could just as easily be ELA. Um, it, it's bringing in all the subject areas and figuring out how can the arts really drive the instruction that's happening day to day, but also big long-term project-based learning that students are asking questions and figuring out how they can improve their own community. Uh, for example, we have a school that has um, identified, the students identified that there were a number of people living in homelessness in their community and they have taken it upon themselves, they build a tiny house every single year and donate it to a veteran. And um, that's a big PBL that they've adopted as their STEAM process. So um, it, it really is just a total change in what day-to-day -day looks like. For middle and high school, they can opt to do a program certification. So maybe not the whole school, it might be a group of teachers that work towards that certification as a program opposed to the whole school being involved. But we believe that STEM and STEAM is for everyone. It benefits every student. And that's why at the elementary level, we say every student needs to be involved. You need to be providing opportunities for every student in the building. In middle school, it would be more of students that want to opt in to STEAM opposed to other offerings that there might be. And really, you know, I see a lot of connections there too, but just between the, um, you know, what we've seen with the, the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities Now Kennedy Center's Turnaround Arts Program, that when a whole school embraces the arts, school cult culture and climate change, student attendance, parent engagement, you know, there's so many benefits. So that's really another um, fantastic pathway to that. Um, I will open it up to questions from the audience. I would just ask that you use the microphone. It doesn't have to stay on the microphone stand if you would like to pass it around, but um, any questions from the audience? Um, so I, I, I so appreciate your insight into the importance of STEAM and it's so wonderful to hear some higher administrative language and how you're using that at the state level. I guess I'm really, if you could kind of focus, Kate, you were speaking to, I, I, I wasn't, I was sort of getting my notes together. You started speaking to the, the policy pipeline because I think that's what I'm most interested, I, I'm, not to be selfish, but like, um, the, like how this actually, because that's what I think a lot of states and, you know, and districts are having such a hard time with, the responsibility of arts funding just keeps getting deflected from, you know, the municipality to the district and it's just like back and forth. And so 
how did that how did that happen? How did the how did your I mean I heard you say that um, Megan that the who whose priority was it to, that arts became important? Uh, it, the state superintendent. The state superintendent, and that was just what sparked all of this. You probably know better, but I almost wonder if it was also Governor Deal. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a very red state, um, which is fun. And our governor, <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with that. So, all right, so governor, our Governor Deal um, put together an arts learning task force uh, like five, six, mm -hmm. seven years ago or something like that, and it was made up of teaching artists, uh, art teachers, art administrators, um, school administrators, to really identify how we're not meeting the needs of students in terms of the arts. And that's been really weird. Like, why would Governor Deal, a rep like staunch Republican, you know, that's just not totally common for a Republican governor to see this as a need. I, my, ideas that maybe it's around the um, the booming film industry. Um, so we did that tax thing, you know, that states do. And so the film industry is just totally taken off um, in Georgia. So because of that, we need more employees who are trained in the arts to be able to, you know, be within this creative industry. Um, so perhaps that's why, but also um, I know he has a personal passion for the arts. Um, and so he, he found Richard Woods, who's the state superintendent, who also has a passion for the arts. Um, it's not as good as it could be, but it's pretty awesome that that existed. So from that arts learning task force, things like STEAM education came out of that. And I'll add to the governor has an office of the governor's office of student achievement, which is a separate arm from the Department of Education, and they have a huge focus on innovation. So they give out a tremendous number of innovation grants to schools all throughout the state, and specifically have a focus on rural Georgia. Um, so that's also driving a lot of the work with both STEM and STEAM. And I'll just I'll fill in a couple of the gaps. So um, at the federal level, the law passed in 2015 and um, in December, and every state had to submit their um, state ESSA plans by uh, there were two deadlines. I think there was like an April deadline and a September deadline. Um, and I believe Georgia's was like the September, the later one. Um, and what we saw is that, um, and there's a great piece on the Arts Education Partnerships website that looks at every state and how they took advantage of those dozen or so arts-friendly provisions that I talked about. Um, and Georgia did embrace, because of their strategic planning process that had already been there, uh, been in place, they embraced STEAM in their state ESSA plan. Um, and that manifests itself in a couple of ways, and I'll just highlight some of the um, specific policy language, which is what you asked for, that these folks talked about around title for Part A, which is the well-rounded provision, and it, that includes the new money for um, local education agencies to consider um, the arts or STEM or STEAM um, together in their um, needs assessment of what is being delivered to deliver on that promise of, an art, of a well-rounded education for all students um, in that district. Additionally, there's money in Title II. Um, Title II is teacher professional development, which is what Kate talked about, um, that actually explicitly says that school districts can use teacher professional development money to partner with a community-based organization. And the bill, no joke, says, like museums, theater companies, dance companies, arts education institutions, and so forth. So the, the opportunity is huge there um, in those two sets of provisions. So Title IV Part A and Title II are kind of the manifestations of how this worked along with the state plan. Um, additionally, pundits are pretty much saying that this law will not go away anytime soon. We're probably going to be in it for the next 12 to 20 years. Um, and that, um, but that because of the way the presidential administration changed over um, with Secretary King and Secretary DeVos um, at the U.S. Department of Education, they asked for the plans very quickly, and states were not experts at a lot of the things that they were asked to do. So we do anticipate that states will revise their adopted plans 
quite frequently, maybe every two or three years moving forward. Um, so there's lots of advocacy moments to do that because, as I mentioned, the pipeline moves federal to state to local, but the influence from local to state to federal is huge. So it is no doubt in my mind, and I'm not an expert on Georgia, but that the High Museum have been doing this for a number of years and other folks around Georgia and the state was like, oh, cool, we know it works, so let's write it into our plan. And then the federal level will say, oh, look, Georgia's doing this. And you know, other states, A, B, and C, are also doing it, so let's work it into federal policy. Um, that's kind of how that, that pipeline works. Hello, um, I'll go quick, because I might catch you guys after. My name's Eileen Edwards, I'm from Atlanta, <laughs> and um, I currently teach, I've taught at two different performing arts high schools in the metro area, Pebble Brook and at North Springs in Fulton, and um, my question is, is there a way to maybe tap into some of the educators that are in these magnet schools that are arts, you know, have arts uh, background and training, but also are public school teachers and could kind of help. But then the flip side of that is not losing your own curriculum time, you know, and things like that, because when PBL was the big kind of education ease, um, things, you know, change about every two years. Uh, everybody my email was blowing up because they wanted, everybody wanted to bring their kids to my studio to do dance. Like we did the Charleston with the Great Gatsby group, but you know, and, and I loved doing it, but I also have an obligation to train my kids that want to go to school for dance. And so I just didn't know if there's any discussion of maybe kind of even summer or, you know, other ways to use some of the, um, you know, people that have kind of that dual training of being public school educators and the arts training to maybe kind of help. Cause I know, you know, reaching out with dance companies and things like that is amazing and the kids get those experiences, but it's also like for like getting teachers a little more background to like use the, just for movement, and, you know, different ideas for that. I was just curious if like kind of the magnet school um, cause, uh, versus, you know, schools that don't have dance, you know, in their schools, how can you make that happen a little easier? And because um, I feel passionately on both sides, I just happen to be in a magnet school, you know, um, I just didn't know if there'd been any thought or ways to kind of integrate or use those resources? Um, one thing that you mentioned was that piece of not losing your curriculum as an arts educator, and I think that's really important with STEAM. Um, sometimes I think schools will move towards, okay, we're going to put this all on our art specialists, we're going to put this all on the art teacher, the music teacher, um, where really it's more about pushing it out to the rest of the school, and you have to maintain those classes where it's art for art's sake. Um, the students need that space to learn the foundations of art or the foundations of music or theater or dance. So maintaining the integrity of those classes is, is important. The art teacher can't become the STEAM teacher. Um, so I think that's a big piece that we really push in our STEAM schools. Yes, use them for that in-house professional learning and to help train and plan with the other teachers, but that classroom needs to uh, remain the arts classroom and not become a STEAM classroom. Um, to your other question, I think professional learning opportunities, we do provide a conference every year, uh, the STEM, and now it's now the STEM STEAM Forum. Uh, maybe we'll come up with a more creative name eventually, but now it's the STEM STEAM Forum, which we do uh, encourage educators to come and share their expertise. And I know the High Museum and the Woodruff Art Center also does professional learning. Thank you. Yeah, is that in October? Oh yes, that's October 21st through 23rd. And, and just for anyone who would be interested in coming to that, it's a big conference that we host in Athens, Georgia, which is where the University of Georgia is located. And it's really just an opportunity for educators. And we get people from all over the country who come in and share what they're doing with STEM. And really, this year will be a big push to have more sessions that focus on STEAM. But yeah, I mean, arts magnet schools are, we look to them. You know, I mean, you guys have been doing a lot of this work already for so long that it's important to partner with schools like that to be stronger. And I, I wasn't, you know, none of my colleagues know I'm saying this or volunteering us for this, but You're being I'd like, be down with it, you know? Yeah. Like, I, shut up, Eileen. Um, okay, were you? You're being live streamed. They can all hear you. Hi, my name is Lauren Chenta. I'm at the Flynn Center for the Performing Arts in Burlington, Vermont. And we've had a huge shift in Act 77 policy. Um, and so looking at personalized learning plans and flexible pathways becoming graduation requirements. So there's an increasing urgency in the arts being a part of that. And 
in things that we've been doing for years as a part of our programming, they're now becoming really emergent desires. So I'm wondering, Kate, when you started to implement these programs, did you come into any challenges in making sure that you had authentic implementation that wasn't stretching your staff? And how did you really grow that program so that you could be responsive, but in a thoughtful manner? Um, I think that probably, so I got to be on the STEAM, some of the STEAM certification committees of going school to school. Um, and almost a, that's where I start to see what you're talking about. And Megan might have better examples of this, of STEAM gone wrong, you know, where it's just not, it's that, that metaphor of it's a, the painted uh, birdhouse. You know, it's, that's not what STEAM is. It's not just painting a birdhouse and calling it pretty, but it's having artists help to build the birdhouse. Um, within our own program at the high, I think that we came across a lot of challenges when it came to uh, training docents and training people who weren't um, thinking about the arts in that way, um, thinking about design thinking or creative problem solving when it comes to a Monet. You know, that's, that, that was a shift. Um, and like any cultural shift or culture, institutional culture shift, it took about three years um, to get people on board. Um, so at the beginning, and Megan remembers this, it was, there was just so much drama. There was like tears, um, yeah. there was crying. <laughs> yeah, like people were really upset because it seemed as if we were taking something away from them. Um, but now I have my docents presenting at conferences on their own about STEAM. Um, so it was kind of a gradual sort of, it's okay, it's not as scary as it seems. Um, see it being done and implemented in the galleries in a meaningful way. Um, and people kind of, they'll get there. But you, yeah, there was, there was a lot of kicking and screaming at first. And it's interesting because I see the same thing with teachers. Um, there was a teacher I worked with earlier this year who was really struggling with STEAM and feeling overwhelmed, and now she's writing her dissertation on STEAM. She's wow. fallen so in love with it. Um, so it is that kind of patience and figuring out how can we have authentic instruction happening, and when it is meaningful, the teachers are more engaged and more excited. Um, I would encourage all districts to block Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers permanently because uh, that's where a lot of your kind of paint, paint the bridge and birdhouse come from, opposed to really learning and engaging in the amazing innovative work that's happening in the arts communities. So I have two questions. Does the Department of Education still have arts consultants or whatever you, arts specialists as well, or is it you alone? It's me alone. Okay. Uh, I work with one other person. We are the two STEM STEAM specialists in the state, um, and her background's in math and mine's in visual arts. Um, but a big piece that we're looking to is training district leaders as well as some of our local educational agencies to support this work moving into next year and years beyond. Um, it, it's a small team. I put a lot of miles on rental cars each week driving around the state of Georgia. Um, but we do encourage our schools to look to their local resources too, who in their community, communities can help with training, whether it's museums, local, local teaching artists. Uh, the Georgia Council for the Arts has been instrumental in helping me when I'm going to a town that I've never heard of, will help pull different artists and arts organizations in that area that I can direct them to as well. Okay, thanks. And my next question is, so my experience has in arts integration and just getting into STEAM. Um, museums tend to really be ahead of the game with understanding what STEAM is. What's your experience with working with maybe theater companies or dance folks or symphony, music people, whatever? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that all of the different types of arts organizations have an incredible amount to offer. And I do encourage when I'm working with schools, even if there's 
an arts organization that isn't specifically doing STEAM in their area, there's still a lot to learn from working with any type of artist. So if it's working with someone in theater, looking at all the tech that goes into theater, or looking, um, working with musicians, learning about their process, but just being, going into that experience, asking probing questions um, to be able to get the most out of it as possible. But I think that that collaboration and the different organizations that exist within Georgia to have that communication across cultural institutions, which Kate has actually founded one that's in Atlanta, is really helpful too. So there's that sharing from museums that have established programs to support other types of organizations that don't. And Kate's done incredible work in that area. And I'll just highlight um, on the national front, there's the organization I mentioned earlier, the Innovation Collaborative, innovationcollaborative.org, um, did a, um, a study through the University of Florida that looked at the uh, effective lesson plans or effective practices in crafting lesson plans among the four STEM subjects and the five arts disciplines. So um, for example, in these model um, lesson plans that they've published um, in the K-12 space, it'll be um, uh, some sort of activity, but that is aligned to both next gen science standards and national core art standards in dance, for example. Um, and it shows how it plays out. And the next phase is to do like evaluation and stuff and how do you evaluate those. But um, there's a, a number of resources in that space. Um, and, and I think too, you know, you mentioned painting a birdhouse. I feel like it's also in steam world. It's like dancing the, eco the solar system. And it's like you, the kid just spins and is like, I'm Pluto. And you're like, no, uh, that's not real. So I, the, I think that is the next step is we have the policy in place and we're working on now connecting that to the practice to make sure that it's um, quality. Thank you, this has been really exciting. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think it's Lauren, um, how your work um, is different from your work when you when you were at the Hyde Museum and how it's shifted, and um, what qualifications you had to kind of push toward to, to be the STEAM specialist. Um, the work is very different because I drive a lot. Um, I am in the car all the time driving. No, but beyond that, uh, there are a lot of similarities in the work in terms of thinking about curriculum from a different perspective and thinking about how non-art subjects can be connected to the arts. So that experience that I had at the high has been so instrumental in going into schools um, and really helping direct them to creating their own types of lesson plans. Uh, it's different in that I don't create them for them. We want the teachers to really be engaged in that process and be engaged in how do I do this? How do I do some research on the arts and figure out how to bring that in and how can I connect the science to the math and the arts? Uh, so it's more of a coaching position and helping them figure out how to do that on their own. Um, in terms of getting to this position, I was fortunate to get to work on a lot of the STEAM initiatives at the High Museum and Kate really coached me and worked with me. It's been an incredible mentor, continues to be. Uh, to learn about, about STEAM. I think, honestly, I didn't tell you this when I interviewed, but going into working at the high, I really did think that STEAM was art robots and green screens, and that was it. Um, I didn't understand how wide of a net STEAM is. Um, so, you know, I, in terms of the qualifications, I would say I'm learning every single day more about what STEAM is and how to support teachers in doing this, but um, it's kind of taking that dive in of, all right, we're going to figure this out and we're all going to figure it out together and uh, just try and do what's best for kids. Thank you very much. I think they were also, she's being humble, but they were really looking, they already had a science person, um, they had a fine arts specialist, but they were looking for someone who had a background in arts integration, and Megan brought that to the table. Um, so that it was like a unicorn, finding someone who has worked in community organizations, but also understands arts integration and can talk to the visual art side. Because the CTAE people, the career technology, agriculture, engineering, they're so strange. They're so different um, than arts people. And a really, I love them. I love them so much. So they really needed a Megan, um, and I think they found one with her. But anyway. 
Thank, thanks, well, Megan. And, and I would say, Love too, you. that's a, um, and this is just a, a shameless plug for anyone who's working at the state level, Americans for the Arts is engaging in a um, kind of two-step research process right now. We have an author who's um, putting together kind of a, the white paper on STEAM. There is no paper that kind of tracks the history and definition and, you know, and all of that. Um, so we're trying to put together that resource, but we're also um, doing a, a survey among state policy leaders to figure out what else is happening, what types of supports are in states, what types of policy, um, beyond just the quick survey of what's in state ESSA plans or the fact that we know that um, Megan does exist in her role, but no, there are no other states that have that same structure. So um, we want to determine that and, and set a baseline to try and push that um, and maybe replicate this type of thing. Um, but I think, you know, really what we're, um, talking about here and what on a philosophical level we're saying, we're just assigning a new name to a very long-standing practice, which is arts integration. Um, it's just arts integrated into STEM, which is just a new name for subjects that we've already had. And, um, you know, we, I, I did a presentation, I think it was actually Lauren with you in Cincinnati, and there was a teacher that was like, well, what, what does STEAM mean for, you know, kindergartners? I'm like, do the kids, like, play with Legos and create their own structures? You know, in, in a way, like, that's that's engineering, you know, and then you engage artistic practice in that. So it's not um, revolutionary what we're doing, it's just kind of uh, formalizing the practice and, and working out all of those, um, those hiccups that might be along the way um, as it relates to the system that we're in, which is why we're framing this conversation around the policies, because the policies are what can actually cause some of those hiccups or that can um, preclude schools from moving in that direction or, or whatever it might be. Thank we have you. Time? Yeah, we have time for like one more question, I think. Um, I, you've talked a lot of it about how you're the first person to have this STEAM title and how the state model is very unique. Do you guys have, is there a data report from the Department of Education about the impact of STEAM? I mean, it sounds like that there are several other districts who want to expand and expand the role within their district. And a lot of times, um, coming from an arts organization and working directly with the teachers, their biggest obstacle is, well, can you prove that this is going to work? You know, and they're not always given that, you know, what is it, it's one to three years to learn a system, three to five years to become um, able to implement it correctly, and five to ten years to master it. So it's like within the time frame, half the time they're not given that, and if they don't have data to back it up from another place, they can't make a case for it, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a great question. We don't have a formal report. Uh, we do collect test scores from every school that is seeking to be certified. Um, and we find that all of our schools that have implemented with integrity that their scores go up. And we look at three years, but they also um, have requested su to submit some of that additional data, such as behavior and attendance. Um, right now, if you look at our website, you might not even know that there is STEAM in Georgia. It has been a, a huge challenge. We're actually renovating and putting up a new website that we're hoping to launch August 1st that'll have a lot of information about what our schools look like, the work that they're doing, the importance of STEAM, and some of that information about the impact. So uh, keep, keep an eye out. It's uh, qu quite a bit of work getting that going, but we're excited and it'll be hopefully a great resource for the schools in Georgia, but also others looking to implement a similar, similar model. And I will just say again, too, that there's um, a number of resources, um, particularly related to the Every Student Succeeds Act and the new requirements for um, evidence-based um, uh, intervention, so that basically before a state or a local school district could move to a strategy, they do actually need to present data, particularly if they're um, a, a Title I school or another federally funded school. So um, there are four tiers of evidence, um, and it's very interesting because um, the Wallace Foundation has invested in two types of reports, one um, looking at a meta-analysis of all, like I think it was like 700, 800 studies on arts integration, um, and then they mapped them against the um, four tiers of evidence, and they did the same, um, and it has not come out yet, but it will, I think, this summer, um, around discipline-based arts ed. So it kind of hits the two tones that we were talking about before. But the arts integration one, the only study that has happened in the last, I think it's eight years or 10 years, in the United States um, was the study from um, Crystal Bridges in Arkansas um, that was about a visit, which was, I, I, personal note, you know, with the headline in the New York Times was like, kids go to museum for one hour and they're better people for life. And I was like, you, what? You know, like, come on. But the, 
that was the headline. The study itself is really great and is statistically significant and has all of the meets the requirements of um, testability and all those things that um, they look for in that Title One, or excuse me, in that um, Tier One of research. But you show if you're a community partner, you show that no one's going to read this. I can't even read half the graphs in the study, but it you know, it is that headline, you present that headline the right way and you can make the case. And truly, if it is federal dollars that you're using, you can really make the case because most dollars only require tier three or tier two. So being tier one is awesome. Um, we'd love more of those things. It would be awesome if Georgia got a huge grant to, you know, a couple million bucks to go study the impact. But, um, you know, right now there is that evidence base there. Um, it's just telling that story. All right, well, um, we are just about at time, so I'll just offer um, our speakers one last closing thought, if you have it, um, piece of advice for folks pursuing this. Um, I think STEAM is not a thing that's going away, so if you're not yet bought in, hopefully this session helped. If you are bought in, hopefully you're inspired to take some action, but I'll offer you all uh, one last uh, minute to give some advice. Uh, sure, if you're looking to do this kind of work, um, yeah, you can't emphasize partnerships enough and looking to your local arts institutions, looking at, I mean, you're, this is a room full of artists. I mean, you are the ones that are driving the work. So being an advocate for the work, um, otherwise if you just aren't bought in and you're jaded by it, then you're gonna be left behind because um, it's not going away, like Jeff said. Um, so just partnering with artists and local arts institutions to drive the work is really important. Uh, my advice would be just to give it a go. Don't be afraid of failure. I think when you look at the acronym, when you look at STEAM, when you look at all that it encompasses, it's a lot. Um, and no one is an expert going into it. And honestly, I don't know that many people out there who are experts in all of the subject areas that it encompasses. So just knowing that it's about more about the process and the type of thinking and the skills that we're building for students and uh, giving them authentic experiences, but just to go for it and don't be afraid to fail because you'll learn from those failures. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much, and let's hear it uh, for our two speakers here today. And thank you all for coming to this session. Um, we are at time, so we'll clear out of this room and allow space for the next session to come in. Um, selfless, uh, or shameless plug, excuse me, the um, at, at 6.30 today, there is a uh, mixer for the Arts Education Network if you're an arts ed person and is, uh, you're interested in meeting up with other arts ed people. 6.30 at Tarantula Billiards, which is a two minute walk. It's like a diagonal from the front door of this building. Um, or you can feel free to grab more information from the membership table um, for Americans of the Arts and Lobby. Hope to see you there. Thanks.